I didn't like the horse Captain Gus took, Pocampo said. He won't catch Blue Duck on that horse. Blue Duck always has the best horse in the country. That's why he always gets away. He don't have the best horse in this country, Cole said. I do. Yes, that's true. She is a fine mare, Poe said. You might catch up with him, but Captain Gus won't. Blue Duck will sell the woman. Captain Gus might get her back if the Indians don't finish him. I wouldn't make a bet. I'd make one if I had money, Dietz said. Mr. Gus be fine. I didn't think there was much left in the way of Indians, Call said. There are young renegades, Poe said. Blue Duck always finds them. Some are left. The Yano is a big place. That was certainly true. Call remembered the few times they had ventured on it. After a day or two, the men would grow anxious because of the emptiness. There's too much of this nothing, P said. He would say it two or three times a day, like a refrain, as the mirages shimmered in the endless distances. Even a man with a good sense of direction could get lost with so few surface features to guide him. Water was always chancy. I miss Gus, P.I. said. I get to expectin' to hear him talk, and he ain't here. My ears sort of get empty. Call had to admit that he missed him, too, and that he was worried. He had had at least one disagreement a day with Gus for as many years as he could remember. Gus never answered any question directly, but it was possible to test an opinion against him, if you went about it right. More and more Call felt his absence, though fortunately they were having uneventful times. The cattle were fairly well trail-broken and weren't giving any trouble. The crew, for the most part, had been well-behaved, no more irritable or contrary than any other group of men. The weather had been ideal, water plentiful, and the spring grass excellent for grazing. A thought that nagged Call was that he had let Gus go off alone to do a job that was too big for him, a job they ought to have done together. Often, during the day, as he rode ahead of the herd, he would look to the northwest, hoping to see Gus returning. More and more the thought came to him that Gus was probably dead. Men simply vanished into the Yano to die somewhere and lie without graves, their bones eventually scattered by varmints. Of course, Gus was a famous man in his way. If Blue Duck had killed him, he might brag, and word would eventually get back. But what if some young renegade who didn't know he was famous killed him? Then he would simply be gone. The thought that Gus was dead began to weigh on Call. It came to him several times a day, at moments, and made him feel empty and strange. They had not had much of a talk before Gus left. Nothing much had been said. He began to wish that somehow things could have been rounded off a little better. Of course, he knew death was no respecter. People just dropped when they dropped, whether they had rounded things off or not. Still, it haunted him that Gus had just ridden off and might not ride back. He would look over the cattle herd, strung out across the prairie, and feel it was all worthless and a little absurd. Some days he almost felt like turning the cattle loose and paying off the crew. He could take P and Dietz and maybe the boy, and they would look for Gus until they found him. The crew came back from Fort Worth, hung over and subdued. Jasper Fant's head was splitting to such an extent that he couldn't bear to ride, he got off his horse and walked the last two miles, stopping from time to time to vomit. He tried to get the other boys to wait on him. In his state, he could have been easily robbed and beaten, as he pointed out, but his companions were indifferent to his fate. Their own headaches were severe enough. You can walk to China for all I care, Needle said, expressing the sentiments of the group. They rode on and left Jasper to creep along as best he could. Pocampo had anticipated their condition and had a surprise waiting for them. A sugary cobbler made with dewberries he had picked. Sugar is the thing for getting over liquor, he said. Eat a lot and then lie down for a few minutes. Did Jasper quit? Call asked. No, he's enjoying the dry heaves somewhere between here and town, Soupy Jones allowed. Last I heard of him, he sounded like he was about to vomit up his socks. What's the news of Jake? Call inquired. The question produced a remarkable collection of black looks. He's a haughty son of a bitch, Bert Borum said. He acted like he never knowed a one of us. He told me I smelled like cow shit, Needle said. He was sitting there gambling and had some whore hanging over him. 
I wouldn't say he misses that one that got took, Soupy said. Jasper Fant finally straggled in. Everyone was standing around grinning, though he couldn't see why. Something must have happened funnier than what I've been doing, he said. A lot of things are funnier than vomiting, P.I. said. Jasper missed the cobbler, that's the laugh, Alan O'Brien said, not feeling too frisky himself. I used to be better at hangovers back in Ireland. Of course, then I had one every day, he reflected. I had more practice. When Jasper realized he had missed a dewberry cobbler, one of his favorite dishes, he threatened to quit the outfit since they were so ungrateful. But he was too weak to carry out his threat. Polcampo forced him to eat a big spoonful of molasses as a headache cure, while the rest of the crew got the herd on the move. I guess the next excitement will be the old Red River, Dishbogget said as he took the point. Chapter 60 Just as the world had been drying out nicely and the drive becoming enjoyable in Newt's view, it suddenly got very wet again. Two days before they hit the Red River, low black clouds boiled out of the northwest like smoke off grease. It was spring-like and fair in the morning, but before it was even afternoon, the world turned to water. It rained so hard for two hours that it was difficult even to see the cattle. Newt moped along on Mouse, feeling chilled and depressed. By this time they were on a rolling plain bare of trees. There was nothing to get under except the sky. They made a wet camp, and Pocampo poured hot coffee down them by the gallon, but it still promised to be a miserable night. Poe and Dietz, the acknowledged experts on weather, discussed the situation and admitted they didn't know when it might stop raining. It probably won't rain a week, Pocampo said, which cheered nobody up. Dern, it better not rain no week, Jasper said. Them rivers will be like oceans. That night they all herded, not because the cattle were particularly restless, but because it was drier on a horse than on the sopping ground. Newt began to think it had been a mistake to leave Lonesome Dove if it was going to be so wet. He remembered how dry and clear the days had been there. He and Mouse stumbled through the night somehow, though before morning he was so tired he had lost all interest in living. The next day was no better. The skies were like iron, and Mr. Gus wasn't back. He had been gone a long time, it seemed, and so had Lorena. Dish Boggett grew increasingly worried, took to confiding in Newt now and then. Newt respected his feelings, whereas the other hands were distinctly callous when it came to Dish's feelings. Because of Jake, we lost them both, I guess, Dish said. Jake is a goddamn bastard. It was painful to Newt to have to think of Jake that way. He still remembered how Jake had played with him when he was a little child, and that Jake had made his mother get a lively, merry look in her eyes. All the years Jake had been gone, Newt had remembered him fondly, and supposed that if he ever did come back, he would be a hero. But it had to be admitted that Jake's behavior since his return had not been heroic at all. It bordered on the cowardly, particularly his casual return to card-playing once Lorena had been stolen. If she's alive and Gus gets her back, I still aim to marry her, Dish said, as rain poured off his hat in streams. Dern, we should be herding fish, he said a little later, holding the point nonetheless, though he hardly felt like it. If Lorena was indeed dead, he meant to stay clear of other women and grieve for her for a lifetime. It was still raining when they came to the low banks of the Red River. The river was up somewhat, but it was still not a very wide channel or a very deep one. What worried Call was the approach to it, over a hundred yards of wet, rusty-colored sand. The red was famous for its quicksands. Dietz sat with him, looking at the river thoughtfully. It had long represented the northern boundary of their activity. The land beyond the rusty sands was new to them. Do you think we ought to wait and let it go down? Call asked. It ain't going down, Dietz pointed out. Still raining. Dish came over to watch as Dietz probed for a crossing, several times checking his horse and moving to the side to seek firmer footing. I guess this will spoil Jasper's digestion, he said, for Jasper's sensitivity on the subject of rivers was becoming more pronounced. We bogged sixty head of Mr. Pierce's cattle in this very river, although that was over toward Arkansas. 
I must have had a hundred pounds of mud on my clothes before we got them out. Dietz put his horse into the surging water and was soon across the channel, but had to pick his way across another long expanse of sand before he was safely on the north bank. Evidently, he didn't like the crossing, because he waved the others back with his hat and loped away down river. He was soon out of sight in the rain, but came back in an hour with news of a far better crossing downstream. By then the whole crew was nervous, for the red was legendary for drowning cowboys, and the fact that they had nothing to do but sit and drip increased general anxiety. But their fears were unfounded. The rain slowed and the sun broke through as they were easing the cattle across the mud flats toward the brownish water. Dietz had found a gravel bar that made the entrance to the river almost as good as a road. Old Dog led the herd right in and was soon across and grazing on the long wet grass of the Oklahoma Territory. Five or six of the weaker cows bogged as they were coming out, but they were soon extracted. Dish and Soupy took off their clothes and waded into the mud and got ropes on the cows, and Bert Borum pulled them out. The sight of the sun put the men in high spirits. Hadn't they crossed the Red River and lived to tell about it? That night the Irishmen sang for hours, and a few of the cowboys joined in. They had gradually learned a few of the Irish songs. Sometimes Pocampo sang in Spanish. He had a low, throaty voice that always seemed like it was about to die for lack of breath. The songs bothered some of the men, they were so sad. Poe, you're a jolly fella. How come you only sing about death? Soupy asked. Poe had a little rattle made from a gourd, and he shook it when he sang. The rattle plus his low, throaty voice made a curious effect. The sound could make the hairs stand upon P.I.'s neck. That's right, Poe. You do sing sad for a happy man, P.I. observed once as the old man shook his gourd. I don't sing about myself, Campo said. I sing about life. I am happy, but life is sad. The songs don't belong to me. Well, you sing them. Who do they belong to? P. asked. They belong to those who hear them, Poe said. He had given Dietz one of the little women figures he whittled. Dietz was very proud of it and kept it in the pocket of his old chaps. Don't give none of them to me, P.I. said. They're too sad. I'll get them nervous dreams. If you hear them, they belong to you, Poe said. It was hard to see his eyes. They were deep set anyway, and he seldom took his big brimmed hat off. I wish we had a fiddle, Needle said. If we had a fiddle, we could dance. Dance with who? Bert asked. I don't see no ladies. Dance with ourselves, Needle said. But they didn't have a fiddle, just Po Campo shaking his rattle and the Irishman singing of girls. Even on a nice clear night, the sad singing and the knowledge that there were no ladies was enough to make the men feel low. They ended up talking of their sisters, those that had them, most nights. Call heard little of the talk or the singing, for he continued to make his camp apart. He thought it best. If the herd ran, he would be in a better position to head it. Gus's absence depressed him. It could only mean that something had gone wrong, and they might never find out what. One night, cleaning his rifle, he was startled by the sound of his own voice. He had never been one to talk to himself, but as he cleaned the gun, he had been having in his head the conversation with Gus that there had not been time to have before Gus left. I wish you'd killed the man when you had a chance, he said. I wish you'd never encouraged Jake to bring that girl. The words had just popped out. He was doubly glad he was alone, for if the men had heard him, they would have thought him daft. But no one heard him except the hell bitch, who grazed at the end of a long rope. Every night he slipped one end of the rope beneath his belt and then looped it around his wrist so there would be no chance of her taking fright and suddenly jerking loose from him. Call had become so sensitive to her movements that if she even raised her head to sniff the air, he would wake up. Usually it was no more than a deer or a passing wolf, but the mare noticed, and Call rested better knowing she would watch. Chapter 61 Augustus figured that two or three days' ride east would put them in the path of the herds, but on the second day the rains struck, making travel unpleasant. He cut Lorena a crude poncho out of a tarp he had picked up at the buffalo hunter's camp. 
But even so, it was bad traveling. The rains were chill, and it looked like they might last, so he decided to risk adobe walls. The old fort offered the only promise of shelter. They got there to find the place entirely deserted and most of the buildings in ruins. Not enough buffalo, Augustus said. It wasn't two years ago that they had that big fight here, and now look at it. It looks like it's been empty fifty years. The only signs of life were the rattlesnakes, of which there were plenty, and mice, which explained the snakes. A few owls competed with the snakes for the mice. They found a room whose roof was more or less intact, and whose fireplace even worked once Augustus poked loose an owl's nest. He broke up the remains of an old wagon to make a fire. This weather'll slow call up, Augustus said. I expect they all think we're dead by now. Lorena still had not spoken. She found her silence hard to give up. It seemed her best weapon against the things that could happen. Talk didn't help when things were worst. No one was listening. If the Kiowas had got to do what they would have liked to do, she could have screamed her voice out and no one would have heard. Gus was perfectly patient with her silence. He didn't seem to mind it. He just went on talking as if they were having a conversation, talking of this and that. He didn't talk about what had happened to her, but treated her as he always had in Lonesome Dove. Though she didn't talk, she couldn't stand to have Gus out of her sight. At night she rolled in his blanket with him. It was only then that she felt warm. But if he stood up to do some errand, she watched him, and if the errand took him outside, she got up and went out too. The second day the rains still poured. Gus poked around the fort to see if he could find anything useful, and came across a large box of buttons. There was a woman here during that fight, I recollect, he said. I guess she took off so fast she left her button box. There were all sizes of buttons. It gave Augustus an idea. He had a pack of cards in his saddlebags, which he quickly produced. Let's play a few hands, he said. The buttons can be our money. He spread a blanket near the fireplace and sorted the buttons into piles according to size. There were some large horn buttons that must have been meant for coats. Them will be our fifty-dollar gold pieces, he said. These here will be tens, and these little ones can be fives. This is a high-stakes game we're playing. Don't you cheat, Gus, Lorena said suddenly. If you cheat, I won't give you no pokes. Augustus was so pleased to hear her talk that tears came into his eyes. We're just playing for buttons, honey, he said. For the first hand or two, Lorena made mistakes. She had forgotten what the cards meant, but it quickly came back to her, and she played avidly, even laughing once when she won a hand. But the playing soon tired her. It seemed anything tired her if she did it long, and she still trembled at the least thing. When Gus saw that she was tiring, he made a pallet for her by the fireplace and sat by her while she napped. Her bruises were healing. She was much thinner than she had been when Blue Duck took her away. Her cheeks had hollowed. Outside, the rain pelted the long prairies. The roof had a leak in one corner, and a little stream of water dripped down one wall. They stayed in the walls for two days, comfortably out of the wet. That first evening, by good luck, Augustus happened to see a deer grazing just outside the wagon yard. That night they had venison, and Lorena ate with real appetite for the first time. Eat like that, and you'll soon be the most beautiful woman in Texas again, Augustus said. Lorena said nothing. That night she woke up crying and shaking. Augustus held her and crooned to her as if she were a child but she didn't go back to sleep. She lay on the pallet, her eyes wide open. An hour or two before dawn, the rain stopped, and soon a bright sun shone above the wet prairie. I wish we could stay here, Lorena said, when she saw Gus making preparations to leave. We might not last long if we did, Augusta said. Every mangy renegade that's left loose knows about this place. If a bunch of them showed up at once, we'd be in trouble. Lorena understood that, but she didn't want to go. Lying on the pallet and playing cards for buttons was fine, so long as it was just Gus who was there. She didn't want to see the other men for any reason at all. She didn't want them to see her. There was a strong feeling within her that she should stay hidden. She wanted Gus to hide her. 
I don't want them, she said, looking at Gus. You won't have to have them, Augusta said. I'll see your let be. But we can't stay here. Game's skimpy, and there's no telling who'll come along. Lorena began to cry when she got on her horse. She could no longer control her tears. They were apt to come at any time. Though, like talk, they did no good. Things happened, no matter how hard you cried. Now, Laurie, don't you fret no more than you have to, Augusta said. We'll get over to where the cowboys are, and then we'll be fine. You'll get to San Francisco yet. Lorena had almost forgotten what San Francisco was. Then she remembered, a place with boats where it was cool. It was where Jake had promised to take her. Jake had gone out of her mind so completely, while she was confused, that it was strange to think of him. It was like thinking of someone who had died. Where is Jake? she asked. I don't know, Augusta said. He wanted to come with me, but I didn't want to put up with the scamp. They rode until the afternoon, keeping close to the Canadian, which was high from the rains. Toward evening they topped a ridge and saw a surprising sight. Four great herds of cattle spread as far as one could see across the plain. Rivers stopped them, Augusta said. They're all waiting for it to go down. The cowboys were still a mile or more away, but Lorena began to shake at the sight of them. They were just more men. They won't hurt you, honey, Augusta said. Likely they'll be more scared of you than you are of them. Most of them's probably forgot what a woman looks like. Lorena fell back into her silence. She had nowhere else to go. As they approached the nearest herd, a man galloped out to meet them. My lord, it's the man from Yale College, the one who read that Latin on my sign, Augustus said. I recognize the horse. It's that nice bay we stole back from old Pedro just before he died. Lorena didn't look at the man. Will Barger was as surprised as Augustus. He had seen two riders and supposed they were scouts for yet another herd. By God, McRae, you're a surprise, he said. I thought you was three weeks behind me, and here you are attacking from the west. How far back is your herd, or do you have one? As you can see, I ain't brought a cow, Augustus said. Call may still have a herd of them if he ain't lost them or just turned them loose. If he would do that, he's a fool. And he didn't act like a fool, Will Barger said. He wouldn't trade me that mare. He tipped his hat to Lorena. I don't believe I've met the young lady, he said. This is Miss Lorena Wood, Augusta said. She had the misfortune to be abducted. Now I've abducted her back. We're short of grub and would like to purchase some if you have any to spare. Will Barger glanced once more at Lorena, who sat with her head down. I'm not such a scoundrel as to sell grub, he said. You're welcome to come to camp and eat with my tough bunch if you can stand them. I doubt we could, Augusta said quietly. We're both shy. Oh, I see, Will Barger said, glancing at Lorena again. I'm damn glad you don't have a herd. You'd think there'd be room enough for everybody on these plains, but as you can see, the view is crowding up. I was going to try a crossing today, but I've decided to wait for morning. He was silent a moment, considering the problem of their shyness. We're about to eat, he said. It's a free country, so my advice to you would be make camp where you choose. I'll borrow a pot from our cook and bring you some grub once you get settled. I'm much obliged, Augustus said. Noticed a tree in these parts? No, sir, Will Barger said. If there was a tree in these parts, I'd be sitting under it. They made camp on the plain. Will Barger was as good as his word. In an hour, he returned with a small pack mule. Besides an ample pot of beefsteak and beans, he brought a small tent. I scarcely use this tent, Will Barger said, dropping it by their campfire. You're welcome to borrow it. The young lady might like a little privacy. I guess it's your training in Latin that gives you such good manners, Augustus remarked. The sky is unpredictable, and we would enjoy a tent. I also brought a bottle, Will Barger said. I seem to remember you're a drinking man. As soon as the tent was up, Lorena went in. Gus spread her a pallet, and she sat where she could watch him through the open flap. The men sat outside and drank. Had an easy trip? Augustus asked. No, sir, Will Barger said. My foreman died south of Fort Worth. I have another herd somewhere ahead of me, but I can't leave to go check on it. I don't know that I'll ever see it again, although I may. 
What did he die of? Augustus asked. It's a healthy climate down that way. He died of a horse falling over backwards on him, Will Barger said. He would test the Bronx. Foolish, Augustus said. A grown man ought to have sense enough to seek gentle horses. Many don't, Will Barger pointed out. That mayor Captain Call wouldn't trade me didn't look that gentle. Yet he's a grown man. Grown, but not what you'd call normal, Augustus said. I put it down to lack of education. If he'd been trained in Latin, he'd most likely have let you have that horse. Do you consider yourself normal then? Will Barger asked. Certainly, Augustus said. I never met a soul in this world as normal as me. And yet here you sit, far out on the naked plain with a shy woman you had to rescue, Will Barger pointed out. How many skunks did you have to kill in order to rescue her? A passel, Augusta said. I got the peons, but the jefe got away. A bandit named Blue Duck, whom I'd advise you to give a wide berth, unless you're skilled in battle. You think he's around? I've heard of the scamp. No, I think he's headed for the Purgatory River, Augusta said. But then I underestimated him once, which is why the lady got abducted. I'm out of practice when it comes to figuring out bandits. She's a little peaked, that girl, Will Barger said. You ought to take her back to Fort Worth. There's not much in the way of accommodations or medical care north of here. We'll ease along, Augusta said. Where shall I return this tent? I have business in Denver later in the year, Will Barger said. That's if I live, of course. Send it over to Denver if you have a chance. I don't use the darn thing much, but I might next winter if I'm still out where it's windy. I'm enjoying this whiskey, Augustus said. A man is foolish to give up the stable pleasure of life just to follow a bunch of shitting cattle. You have a point, and it's a point I've often taxed myself with, Will Barger said. If you're such a normal boy, then how come you done it? Unfinished business in Ogallala, Nebraska, Augusta said. I'd hate to grow old without finishing it. I see, Will Barger said. Another shy lady who must have got abducted. They drank until the bottle was empty. If you had two, I wish you'd brought two, Augusta said. I need to get back and practice drinking. Well, if we don't get across that goddamn river tomorrow, I'll see if I can rustle up another one, Will Barger said, standing up. I seldom get conversation like yours. I can't figure out if I like it or not, but I will admit it's conversation, which is more than can be had in my camp. He mounted his horse and was about to ride away. I'll send the cook over with some breakfast, he said. By the way, you didn't cross the path of a young sheriff from Arkansas, did you? He's up this way somewhere, and I've been worried about him. You must be referring to July Johnson, Augustus said. We left him four days ago. He was headed on north. Well, he had a funny crew with him. I was just a little uneasy, Will Barger said. I found him a likable man, but inexperienced. He's got more experience now, Augustus said. Blue Duck killed his crew. Killed all three of them? Will Barger asked, startled. I even offered that young boy a job. He should have took it, Augusta said. We buried them west of here. That duck must be a hard son of a bitch, Will Barger said. He sat on his horse a moment, looking into the night. I had a feeling young Johnson was inexperienced, he said, and trotted off. The next morning, Will Barger's old cook came over with some breakfast. It was a fine morning the sun up and the plains well dried out. Augusta stepped out of the tent, but Lorena was content to look through the flaps. This is like living in a hotel, Lori, Augusta said. We got people toting us meals as fast as we can eat them. At that point, the cook got careless, and the little pack mule took a kick at him, which barely missed. He's getting tired of making this trip, the cook said. Or it could just be the company he's tired of, Augusta suggested. I'd buy him if he was for sale. I've always got along with mules. This mule ain't for sale, the cook said, looking the camp over. I wished all I had to do was live in a tent. Without further ado, he turned and went back. When he was gone, Lorena came out and sat in the bright sun. While they ate, Will Barger's cowboys began to move the herd toward the river. That Will Barger is a curious man, Augusta said. He's blunt spoken, but I guess he'll do. Before noon, all the herds had crossed, and the wagon and remuda of the last one 
was just moving out of sight to the north. We might as well cross while the crossing's good, Augusta said. It could come another rain. He folded the tent, which was awkward to carry on a horse. His horse didn't like it and tried to pitch, but Augustus finally got him settled down. The river had gone down some, and they crossed without difficulty and made camp on a long ridge about two miles to the north of it. Now then, we ought to be set, Augusta said once he had the tent secured. I imagine the boys will be along in a week or so. Lorena didn't care if they never came along, but she was glad they had the tent. It was scarcely up before rain clouds boiled again out of the northwest. Let her rain. We're ready, Augustus said, taking the box of buttons from his saddlebag. I guess it won't stop us from playing cards. Will Barger had thoughtfully let them have some coffee and a side of bacon, and with those provisions and the tent and the buttons they passed a week. A little of the hollowness left Lorena's cheeks, and her bruises healed. She still slept close to Augustus at night, and her eyes still followed him when he went out to move the horses or do some errand. Once or twice on pretty evenings they rode over to the river. Augustus had rigged a fishing line out of some coarse thread they had found in adobe walls. He bent a needle for a hook and used tadpoles for bait, but he caught no fish. Whenever he went to the river, he stripped off and bathed. Come in, Laurie, he said several times. A bath won't hurt you. Finally she did. She had not washed in a long time, and it felt good. Gus was sitting on a rock not far away, letting the sun dry him. The water was rapid, and she didn't wade in too deep. She was surprised to see how white her skin looked once the dirt was all washed off. The sight of her own brown legs and white belly surprised her so that she began to cry. Once the crying started, she couldn't stop it. She cried as if she would never stop. Gus noticed and walked over to help her out of the river, for she was just standing there sobbing, the water up to her thighs. Gus didn't reprimand her. I expect the best thing is for you to cry it out, Laurie, he said. You just remember, you've got a long time to live. They shouldn't have took me, Lorena said when she stopped crying. She got her rag of a dress and went back to the tent. Chapter 62 Once they hit the territory, Newt began to worry about Indians. He was not alone in his worrying. The Irishman had heard so much about scalping that he often tugged at his own hair as if to reassure himself that it wouldn't come off easily. P.I., who spent most of his time sharpening his knife or making sure he had enough ammunition, was astonished that the Irishman had never seen a scalped person. During P.'s years as a ranger, they were always finding scalped settlers, and for that matter, several of his friends had been scalped. The Spettle boys, who were slowly becoming more talkative, confided in Newt that they would run away and go home if they weren't afraid of getting lost. But you have to drive the horses, Newt pointed out. The captain hired you. Didn't know we was coming where the Indians were, Bill Spettle said. For all the talk, they saw neither Indians nor cowboys for days on end. They saw no one, just an occasional wolf or coyote. It seemed to Newt that the sky got bigger and the country emptier every day. There was nothing to see but grass and sky. The space was so empty that it was hard to imagine that there might ever be towns in it or people. The Irishman particularly found the huge emptiness disturbing. I guess we left the people, he said often, or when's the next people? Nobody was quite sure when to expect the next people. It's too bad Gus ain't here, P.I. said. Gus would know. He's an expert on where places is at. Why, there's nothing north of here, Dish said, surprised that anyone would think otherwise. You have to go east a ways to get into the towns. I thought we was going to strike Ogallala, Needle reminded him. I don't say we won't, Dish said. That's up to the captain. But if it ain't no bigger than Dodge, it wouldn't take much to miss it. Poe Campo had become a great favorite with the men because of the tastiness of his cooking. He was friendly and kind to everyone, and yet, like the captain, he kept apart. Poe just did it in a different way. He might sing to them in his throaty voice, but he was a man of mystery, a strange man, walking all day behind the wagon and at night whittling his little women. Soon each of the cowboys had been given one of the carvings. 
to remind you of your sisters, Poe said. A day and a half before they reached the Canadian, the rains started again. At the sight of the great gray clouds forming in the west, morale immediately sank, and the men untied their slickers, resigned to a long, cold, dangerous night. The storm that struck them half a day from the Canadian was of a different intensity because of the lightning. By afternoon, Newt, who was as usual with the drags, became conscious of rumblings and flashing far on the west. He saw Dietz conferring with the captain, though it was hard to imagine what advice might help. They were out in the middle of the plain, far from any shelter. All through the late afternoon, lightning flickered in the west. As the sun was setting, Newt saw something he had never seen. A bolt of lightning shot south to north, bisecting the setting sun. The bolt seemed to travel the whole length of the western horizon. The crack that came with it was so sharp that Newt almost expected to see the sun split in half like a big red melon. After that bolt, the clouds rolled down on the group like a huge black herd, snuffing out the afterglow in five minutes. The remuda became restless, and Newt rode over to help Pete Spettle, but a bolt of lightning struck so close by that his horse went into a violent fit of pitching and promptly threw him. He had kept a tight grip on the reins, and the horse didn't break free, but Newt had a time calming him enough that he could remount. Claps of thunder were almost constant by then, and so loud that they made his head ring. The herd was stopped, the cowboys spread around it in as tight a ring as possible. Just as Newt mounted, a bolt of lightning struck the edge of the herd not a hundred feet from where the captain rode. A number of cattle instantly fell, as if clubbed by the same club. It was as if a portion of the wall of cattle had broken and fallen to earth like so many bricks. A second later the cattle were running. They broke west in a mass and surged through the riders as if they weren't there, although Dish, the captain, and Dietz were all trying to turn them. The rain came almost as the cattle began to move. Newt spurred and tried to reach the head of the herd, which was nearer him than anyone. He saw a long line of lightning curl down and strike, but the cattle didn't stop. He heard the clicking of thousands of horns as the cattle bumped one another. Again he saw the bluish light rolling on the tips of the cattle's horns, and was glad when the wall of rain came. He rushed to it with relief. Rain was just wet, it didn't scare him, and he knew that if it rained hard enough the lightning would finally stop. The cattle ran for many miles, but soon the storm was to the east of them, and he had only the rain and darkness to contend with. As he had done before, he plodded along much of the night beside the cattle, Occasionally he would hear the shout of another cowboy, but it was too dark and rainy to see anything. The length of such nights was a torment. A hundred times or a thousand he would look in what he thought was an easterly direction, hoping to see the grayness that meant dawn. But all directions were equally black for what seemed like twenty hours. When dawn did come it was a low and gloomy one, the sky heavily overcast. Newt with Dish, the Irishman, and Needle Nelson was with a large portion of the herd, perhaps a thousand cattle. No one was quite sure where the rest of the herd was. The cattle were too tired to be troublesome, so Dish loped off to look and was gone what seemed like half a day. When he finally came back, Dietz was with him. The main herd was six or seven miles east. How many did the lightning hit? Newt asked, remembering the sight of the cattle falling dead. Thirteen, Dish said. That ain't the worst, though. It kilt Bill Spettle. Knocked him right off his horse. They're burying him now. Newt had been feeling very hungry, but the news took his appetite. He had been chatting with Bill Spettle not two hours before the storm began. Bill was beginning to be rather talkative after hundreds of miles of silence. They say it turned him black, Dish remarked. I didn't see it. Newt was never to see where Bill Spettle was buried. When they rejoined the herd, it was on the move, the grave somewhere behind on the muddy plain. No one knew quite what to say to Pete Spettle, who had somehow held the remuda together all night. He was holding it together still, though he looked weary and stunned. The men were all starving, so Call allowed them to stop for a quick feed, but only a quick one. It was looking like rain again. He knew the Canadian was near, and he wanted to cross it before more rains came. Otherwise they might be trapped for a week. 
Ain't we gonna rest? Jasper asked, appalled that they were required to keep driving after such a night. We'll rest north of the river, Call said. Dietz had been sent to find a crossing, but came back almost before he had left. The Canadian was only four miles away, and there was a crossing that had obviously been used by many herds. We all gonna have to swim, he said, to Jasper's consternation. I just hope we don't have to swim in a darn rainstorm, Dish said, looking at the heavy clouds. I don't see what difference it makes, Needle said. It can get just so wet, and if you're swimming, you're bound to be wet. It ought to quit raining. It's rained enough, P.I. said, but the heavens ignored him. Call was more worried than he let on. They had already lost a boy that day, another boy hastily buried, who would never see his home again. He had no wish to risk any more, and yet the river had to be crossed. He loped up to look at the crossing and satisfied himself that it was safe. The river was high, but it wasn't a wide river. They wouldn't need to swim far. He rode back to the herd. Many of the men had changed into their dry clothes while he was gone, a wasteful effort with the river coming up. You best strip off when we get to the river or you'll just get those clothes wet too, Call said. Wrap your clothes up good in your slickers so you'll have something dry to put on when we get across. Ride naked? Jasper asked, shocked that such a thing would be required of him. Northern travel was proving even worse than he had thought it would be. Bill Spettle had been so stiffened when they found him that they had not been able to straighten him out properly. They had just wrapped him in a bedroll and stuck him in a hole. Well, I'd rather be naked a spell than to have to travel in wet duds like we done all last night, P.I. said. When they approached the river, the herd was held up so the men could strip off. It was so chilly that Newt got goosebumps all over his body when he undressed. He wrapped his clothes and tied them high on his saddle, even his boots. The sight of all the men riding naked would have been amusing if he hadn't been so tired and nervous about the crossing. Everyone looked white as a fish belly except their hands and faces, which were brown. Good Lord, we're a bunch of beauties, Dish said, surveying the crew. Dietz is the best looking of the lot. At least he's one color. The rest of us is kind of brindled. Nobody expected weather conditions to get worse, but it seemed that in plains weather there was always room for surprises. A squall blew up as they were starting the cattle into the water, and by the time Old Dog was across the twenty yards of swimming water, dish on one side of him and call on the other, the gray sky suddenly began to spit out little white pellets. Dish, who was out of the saddle, hanging onto his saddle strings as his horse swam, saw the pellets plunking into the water and jerked with fear, for he assumed they were bullets. It was only when he looked up and had a small hailstone peck at his cheek that he realized what was happening. Call, too, saw the hail begin to pepper the river. At first the stones were small, and he wasn't too worried, for he had seen fleeting hail squalls pass in five minutes. But by the time he and Dish hit the north shore and regained their wet saddles, he realized it was more than a squall. Hailstones were hitting all around him, bouncing off his arms, his saddle, his horse, and they were getting larger by the minute. Dish came riding over, still naked, trying to shelter his face and head with one arm. Hailstones were falling everywhere, splashing into the river, bouncing off the backs of the cattle, and plunking into the muddy banks. What will we do, Captain? Dish asked. They're getting bigger. Reckon they'll beat us to death? Call had never heard of anyone being killed by hailstones, but he had just taken a hard crack behind the ear from a stone the size of a pullet egg. Yet they couldn't stop. Two of the boys were in the river, swimming, and the cattle were still crossing. Get under your horse if it gets worse, he said. Use your saddle for cover. This horse would kick me to death if I was to try that, Dish said. He quickly unsaddled and used his saddle blanket for immediate shelter. Newt didn't know what was happening when the first hailstones hit. When he saw the tiny white pellets bouncing on the grass, he assumed he was at last seeing snow. Look, it's snowing, he said excitedly to Needle Nelson, who was near him. It ain't snow, it's hail, Needle said. I thought snow was white, Newt said, disappointed. They're both white, Needle said. The difference is hail is harder. Within a few minutes, Newt was to find out just how hard. The sky began to rain balls of ice, small at first, but then not so small. 
By God, we better get in that river, Needle said. He had a large hat and was trying to hide under it, but the hailstones pounded his body. Newt looked around for the wagon, but he couldn't see it. The hail was so thick. Then he couldn't see Needle either. He spurred hard and raced for the river, though he didn't know what he was supposed to do once he got there. As he ran for the river, he almost trampled Jasper, who had dismounted and made a kind of tent of his slicker and saddle. He was crouching under it in the mud. It was hailing so thickly that when they did reach the river, Mouse jumped off a six-foot bank, throwing Newt. Again, he managed to hang on to his reins, but he was naked, and hailstones were pounding all around him. When he stood up, he happened to notice that Mouse made a kind of wall. By crouching close under him, Newt avoided most of the hailstones. Mouse absorbed them. Mouse wasn't happy about it, but since he had taken it upon himself to jump off the bank, Newt didn't feel very sorry for him. He crouched under the horse until the hailstorm subsided, which was not more than ten minutes after it began. The muddy banks of the Canadian were covered with hailstones, and so were the plains around them. The cattle and horses crunched through the hail as they walked. Isolated stones continued to plop down now and then, bouncing off the ones already there. Newt saw that the cattle had crossed the wild Canadian, the river that had scared everybody, without much help from the cowboys, who were scattered here and there, naked, crouched under their saddles, or in some cases their horses. It was a funny sight. Newt was so glad to be alive that suddenly he felt like laughing. Funniest of all was P.I., who stood not thirty yards away, up to his neck in the river, with his hat on. He was just standing there calmly, waiting for the hail to stop. "'How come you got in the water?' Newt asked when P. waded out. "'It's fine protection,' P. said. "'It can't hail through water.' It was amazing to Newt to see the plains, which had been mostly brown a few minutes before, turned mostly white. The Irishman walked up, leading his horse and kicking hailstones out of the way. He began to pick up the hailstones and throw them in the river. Soon several of the cowboys were doing it, seeing who could throw the farthest or make the hailstones skip across the water. Then they saw a strange sight. Paul Campo was gathering hailstones in a bucket, the two pigs following him like dogs. What do you reckon he expects to do with them? Needle Nelson asked. I guess he'll stew them, probably, P said. He's looking them over like he's picking peas. I wouldn't want to see this outfit naked tomorrow, Jasper said. I guess we'll all be black and blue. One hit me on the elbow and I can't straighten my arm yet. You don't do much with it when you do straighten it, Bert remarked unsympathetically. Just cause he can't rope like you can don't mean he wouldn't like to use his arm, P.I. said. Everyone picked on Jasper, and once in a while P. felt obliged to come to his defense. He swung onto his horse and froze before getting his other foot in the stirrup. He had happened to glance across the river and had spotted a horseman riding toward them. The crew on the north bank had their backs to the rider and hadn't seen him. Why, I swear it's Gus, P.I. said. He ain't dead at all. They all looked and saw the rider coming. How do you know it's him? Bert wanted to know. He's too far. It could be an Indian chief for all you know. I guess I know Gus, P. said. I wonder where he's been. Chapter 63 Call and Dish were just getting into their dry pants when Augustus came riding up. It was not until they heard the sound of his horse crushing the hailstones that they turned around. Call saw at once that Gus was riding a different horse from the one on which he had ridden off, but he himself looked fit. "'Ah, oh God, I never thought you boys would start working naked,' Augustus said. "'I guess the minute I left camp, things went right to hell. "'You jaybirds look like you're scattered from here to Fort Worth.' "'Well, the river was deep, and we ain't overloaded with dry clothes,' Call said. "'What happened to you?' "'Nothing much,' Augustus said. "'I got here last week and decided there wasn't no sense in riding south. "'I'd just have to turn around and come back.' "'Did you ever find Laurie?' Dish asked." Oh, sure, Augusta said. I found her. She's probably sitting out in front of the tent right now, watching you prance around naked. At that, Dish blushed and made haste to get the rest of his clothes on, though when Gus pointed out the tent to him, he saw it was too far away for Laurie to have seen anything. 
At that point, several of the naked cowboys on the south bank plunged into the river and swam over, so excited by Gus's return that they forgot caution. I swear, Gus, we near give you up, P.I. said. Did you catch the bandit? No, but I hope I do someday, Augustus said. I met plenty of his friends, but he slipped by me. Did you get to town or what? Dish asked. You didn't have no tent when you rode off. Mr. Wilbarger loaned me that tent, Augusta said. Lori's feeling shy, and she needs a little privacy. We best get the wagon across, Call said. We can listen to Gus's story later. You boys that ain't dressed, go back and help. The sun came out, and that plus Gus's arrival put the hands in a high mood. Even Jasper, normally so worried about rivers, forgot his fear and swam right back across the Canadian to help get the wagon. They all treated swimming the river like a frolic, though they had been anxious about it for a week. Before long, they had the wagon across. They had put both pigs in it, but the blue shoat jumped out and swam across. That's an independent pig, Augusta said. I see you still got that old cook. Yes, his food's right tasty, Call said. Is the girl all right? She's had an ordeal, but she's young, Augusta said. She won't forget it, but she might outlive it. We're a long way from any place we could leave her, Call said. Oh, I have no intention of leaving her, Augusta said. We've got Will Barger's tent. We'll go along with you cowboys until we hit Nebraska. Then what? Call asked. I don't know. We ain't there yet, Augusta said. What's the word on Jake? He was in Fort Worth when we passed by, Call said. I guess he's mainly card playing. I met that sheriff that's after him, Augusta said. He's ahead of us somewhere. His wife run off and Blue Duck killed his deputy and two youngsters who were traveling with him. He's got other things on his mind besides Jake. He's welcome to Jake if he wants him, Call said. I won't defend a man who lets a woman get stolen and just goes back to his cards. It was wisdom, Augusta said. Blue Duck would have scattered Jake over two counties if he had run into him. I call it cowardice, Call said. Why didn't you kill Blue Duck? He's quick, Augusta said. I couldn't follow him on this piece of soap I'm riding. Anyway, I had Laurie to consider. I hate to let a man like that get away, Call said. Go get him, Woodrow, Augusta said. He's west of here, probably in Colorado. You go get him, and I'll nurse these cows along until you get back. Now what's that old cook doing? They saw all the cowboys gathered around the wagon, which still dripped from its passage through the river. He likes to surprise the boys, Call said. He's always coming up with something different. They trotted over and saw that Pocampo had made the hailstones into a kind of candy with the use of a little molasses. He dipped them in molasses and gave each of the hands one to lick. Well, senor, he said to Augustus, I see you made it back in time for dessert. I made it back in time to see a bunch of naked waddies cross a river, Augustus said. I thought you'd all turned Indian and was aiming to scalp Jasper. Where's young Bill Spettle? Has he gone into hiding? There was an awkward silence. Lippy, sitting on the wagon seat, stopped licking the hailstone he had been given. No, senor, he is buried, Pocampo said. A victim of lightning. That's a pity, Augusta said. He was young and had promise. It killed thirteen head with one bolt, P.I. said. You never seen such lightning, Gus. I seen it, Augusta said. We had a little weather, too. Newt felt warm and happy, his clothes on, and Mr. Gus back with the crew. The sky had cleared, and the clouds that had caused the terrible hail were only a few wisps on the eastern horizon. In the bright sun, with the river crossed and the cattle grazing on the wet grass and Lorena rescued, life seemed like a fine thing, though every once in a while he would remember Bill Spettle, buried in the mud a few miles back, or Sean O'Brien, way down on the Nueces. The warm sun and bright air had brought them no pleasure. Paul Campo had given him a hailstone dipped in molasses, and he sat licking it and feeling alternately happy and sad while the men got dressed and prepared to be cowboys again. Are there any more trees, or does this plane just go on to Kennedy? Bert Borum asked. I wouldn't bet on trees for the next few months, Augustus said. The men wondered about Lorena. Many still held her beauty in their minds. 
What had happened to her? What did she look like now? Hers was the most beauty many of them had seen. And now that she was near, it shone fresh in memory and made them all the more anxious to see her. Dish especially could not keep his eyes off the little tent. He longed for a glimpse of her and kept imagining that any minute she would step out of the tent and look his way. Surely she remembered him. Perhaps she would even wave and call him over. Lorena knew the cowboys were near, but she didn't look out of the tent. Gus had assured her he would be back soon, and she trusted him. Though sometimes, when he was gone for an hour looking for game, she still got the shakes. Blue Duck wasn't dead. He might come back and get her again if Gus didn't watch close. She remembered his face and the way he smiled when he kicked her. Gus was the only thing that kept the memories away and sometimes they were so fresh and frightening that she wished she had died so her brain would stop working and just leave her in the quiet. But her brain wouldn't stop. Only Gus could distract it with talk and card games. Only his presence relaxed her enough that she could sleep. Now and then she peeped out and saw the wagon with Gus standing by it. He was easy to spot because of his white hair. As long as she could spot him, she didn't feel worried. Call let the men camp. They had had a rough twenty-four hours. A big steer had crippled itself crossing the river. Bert roped it, and Pocampo killed it efficiently with a sharp blow of an axe. He butchered it just as efficiently, and soon had beefsteaks cooking. The smell reminded the men that they were famished. They went at the meat like wolves. A cow don't go far with this bunch, Augustus observed. If you boys don't learn to curb your appetites, you'll have eaten the whole darn herd before we strike the Powder River. It'll be a big joke on you, Call, he added. What will, Call asked. His mind had been on Blue Duck. Think of it, Augustus said. You start off to Montana with a bunch of cattle and some hungry hands. By the time you get there, the hands will have et the cattle, and you're back at nothing. Then the Cheyenne or the Sioux will wipe out the hands, and that'll leave you. What about yourself, Call asked. You're along. I'll have stopped and got married, probably, Augustus said. It's time I started my family. Are you marrying Lori then, Gus? Dish asked in sudden panic. He was aware that Gus had saved Lorena from a bad fate and supposed she might be going to marry him in gratitude. No, Dish, I have someone else in mind, Augustus said. Don't run your hopes up no flagpole, though. Lori's apt to be skittish of men for the next few years. Hell, she always was, Needle observed. I offered her good money twice, and she looked right through me like I was a glass window or something. Well, you are skinny, Augustus said. Plus, you're too tall to suit a woman. Women would rather have runts on the whole. The remark struck the company as odd. Why would women rather have runts? And how did Gus know such a thing? But then it was a comforting remark, too for it was like Gus to say something none of them expected to hear. Those that had night guard would be able to amuse themselves with the remark for hours, considering the pros and cons of it, and debating among themselves whether it could be true. Dern, I missed listening to you, P.I. said as Augustus was mounting to leave. Call rode a little way out of camp with Augustus. A flock of cranes came in and settled on the banks of the river. This trip is hard on boys, Augustus said. We've lost two already, and the young sheriff lost a boy and a girl. They stopped for a smoke. In the distance, the night guard was just going out to the herd. We should have stayed lawmen and left these boys at home, Augustus said. Half of them will get drowned or hit by lightning before we hit Montana. We should have just gone ourselves and found some rough old town and civilized it. That's the way to make a reputation these days. I don't want a reputation, Call said. I've had enough outlaws shoot at me. I'd rather have a ranch. Well, I got to admit, I still like a fight, Augustus said. They sharpen the wits. The only other thing that does that is talking to women, which is usually more dangerous. Now you've ended up the caretaker of that girl, Call said. She ain't the woman you're after. Nope, she ain't, Augustus said. He had been pondering that point himself. Of course, for all he knew... Clara was still a happily married woman, and all his thinking about her, no more than idle daydreams. He had long wanted to marry her, and yet life was continually slipping other women between her and him. 
It had happened with his wives earlier. I wish you'd been married, he said to Call. Why? Call asked. I'd like your thoughts on the subject, that's why, Augustus said. Only you ain't got no experience, so you can't be no help. Well, I never come close, Call said. I don't know why. No interest, Augustus said. Also, you ain't never figured yourself out, and you don't like to take chances. I could argue that, Call said. I've taken my share of chances, I guess. In battle, not in love, Augustus said. Unless you want to call what you've done with Maggie taking a chance. Why do you always want to talk about that, Call said. Because it was as close as you ever came to doing something normal, Augustus said. It's all I've got to work with. Here you've brought these cattle all this way, with all this inconvenience to me and everybody else, and you don't have no reason in the world to be doing it. Call didn't answer. He sat smoking. The Irishman had begun to sing to the herd. Since you know so much about me, have you got any suggestions? He asked. Certainly have, Augustus said. Take these cattle over to the nearest cow town and sell them. Pay off whatever boys is still alive. Then what? I'll go deal with the ladies for a while, Augustus said. You take P and Deets and ride up the Purgatory River until you find Blue Duck. Then either you'll kill him or he'll kill all of you. What about the boy? Call asked. Newt can go with me and learn to be a ladies' man, Augustus said. You won't claim him anyway. And the last boy that got near Blue Duck had his head smashed in with a rifle butt. Nope, Call said. I'm primed to see Montana. If we're the first ones there, we can take our pick of the land. You take your pick, Augustus said. I'm in the mood to travel. Once you boys get settled, I may go to China for all you know. And with that he rode off. Call smoked a while, feeling odd and a little sad. Jake had proved a coward and would never be part of the old crew again. Of course he hadn't been for ten years. The old crew was mostly a memory, though P and Dietz were still there, and Gus in his strange way. But it was all changing. He saw the girl come out of the tent when Gus dismounted. She was just a shape in the twilight. Gus said she wouldn't talk much, not even to him. Call didn't intend to try her. He loped a mile or two to the west and put the mare on her lead rope. The sky overhead was still light, and there was a little fingernail moon. Chapter 64 Jake spent most of his days in a place called Bill's Saloon, a little clabbered place on the Trinity River Bluffs. It was a two-story building. The whores took the top story, and the gamblers and cowboys used the bottom. From the top floor there were usually cattle in sight, trailing north, small herds and large. Once in a while a foreman came in, for liquor, and met Jake. When they found out he had been north to Montana, some tried to hire him, but Jake just laughed at them. The week after he left the Hat Creek herd had been a good week, he couldn't draw a bad card, and by the time the week was over, he had a stake enough to last him a month or two. I believe I'll just stay, he told the foreman. I like the view. He also liked a long-legged whore named Sally Skull, at least that was what she called herself. She ran the whoring establishment for Bill Sloan, who owned the saloon. There were five girls, but only three rooms, and with the herds coming through in such numbers, the cowboys were in the place practically all the time. Sally had alarm clocks outside the rooms. She gave each man twenty minutes, after which the big alarm clocks went off with a sound like a fire bell. When that happened, Sally would throw the door open and watch while the cowboys got dressed. Sally was skinny but tall, with short black hair. She was taller than all but a few of the cowboys, and the sight of her standing there unnerved most of the men so much they could hardly button their buttons. The majority of them were just boys anyway, and not used to whorehouse customs and alarm clocks. One or two of the bolder ones complained, but Sally was unimpressed and uncompromising. If you can't squirt your squirt in twenty minutes, you need a doctor, not a whore, she said. Sally drank hard from the time she woke up until the time she passed out. She kept one of the three rooms for her own exclusive use, the one with a little porch off it. When Jake got tired of card playing, 
He would come and sit with his feet propped up on the porch rail and watch the wagons move up and down the streets of Fort Worth. Once Sally had the alarm clock set, she would come in for a few minutes herself with a whiskey glass and help him watch. He had hit it off with her at once, and she let him sleep in her bed, but the bed and the privileges that went with it cost him ten dollars a day, a sum he readily agreed to, since he was on a winning streak. Once he had got his first ten dollars worth, he felt free to discuss the arrangements. What if we don't do nothing but sleep, he asked. Is it still ten dollars? Yep, Sally said. I can buy a dern bed for the night a sight cheaper than that, Jake pointed out. If it's got me in it, it ain't just a bed, Sally said. Besides, you get to sit on the balcony all you want to, unless one of my good sweethearts is in town. It turned out that Sally Skull had quite a number of good sweethearts, some of them so rank that Jake didn't see how she could stand them. She didn't mind mule skinners or buffalo hunters. In fact, she seemed to prefer them. Hell, I'm the only one of your customers that's taken a bath this year, Jake complained. You could take up with bankers and lawyers and the sheets wouldn't stink so. I like a muddy and bloody, Sally said. I ain't nice, this ain't a nice place, and it ain't a nice life. I'd take a hog to bed if I could find one that walked on two legs. Jake had seen hogs that kept cleaner than some of the men Sally Skull took upstairs, but something about her raw behavior stirred him, and he stayed with her and paid the daily ten dollars. The cowboys that came through were very poor card players, so he could usually make his fee back in an hour. He tried other whores in other saloons, skinny ones and fat ones, but with them a time came when he would remember Lorena and immediately lose interest. Lorena was the most beautiful woman he had ever known, and her beauty grew in his memory. He thought of her often with a pang, but also with anger, for in his view it was entirely her own fault that she had been stolen. Whatever was happening to her, it was her punishment for stubbornness. She could easily have been living with him in a decent hotel in Austin or Fort Worth. Sally's skull had bad teeth and a thin body with no particular beauties. Her long legs were skinny as a bird's, and she had nothing that could match Lorena's fine bosom. If anyone said a wrong word to her, they got a tongue lashing that would make the coarsest man blush. If one of her girls got too sweet on a cowboy, which could always happen in her profession, Sal promptly got rid of her shoving her out the back door of the saloon into the dusty street. Don't get in love around me, she would say. Go do it in the alley if you want to give it away. Once she fired three girls in one day for lazing around with the boys. For the next week she serviced most of the customers herself. Jake decided he was crazy for taking up with Sally. She lived too raw for him. Besides the drinking and the men, she also took powders of various kinds, which she bought from a druggist. She would take the powders and lay beside him, wide-eyed, not saying a word for hours. Still, he would be awakened at dawn when she pulled the cork out of the whiskey bottle she kept by the bed. After a few swigs to wake herself up, she would always want him, no matter that she had serviced twenty cowboys the night before. Sally flared with the first light. He couldn't think what he liked about her, yet he couldn't deny her either. She made a hundred dollars a day or more, but spent most of it on her powders or on dresses, most of which she only wore once or twice. When the Hat Creek outfit passed through, some of the men came in and said hello to Jake, but he froze them out. It was their fault that Lorena was lost, and he had no more use for them. But tales about him were told, and they soon got back to Sally Skull. Why'd you let that Indian get your whore? she asked him bluntly. He was a tricky bandit, Jake said. For all I know, she may have liked him. She never liked me much. Sally Skull had green eyes, which dilated when she took her powders. She looked at him like a mean cat that was about to pounce on a lizard. Though it was barely sunup, they had already been at it, and the grimy sheets were a puddle of sweat. She never would mind, Jake said, wishing the Hat Creek outfit had kept their mouths shut. I wouldn't mind you either, Jake, Sally said. I wish I could trade places with her. You what? he asked, mightily startled. I've went with a nigger, but never an Indian, she said. I'd like to try one. 
The news about the nigger was a shock to Jake. He knew Sal was wild, but hadn't supposed she was that wild. The look on her face frightened him a little. You know something else? I paid that nigger, she said. I give him ten dollars to turn whore, and then he never got to spend it. Why not? Jake asked. He bragged, and they hung him from a tree, Sally said. Wrong thing to brag about in Georgia. Some of them wanted to hang me, but they didn't have the guts to hang a woman. I just got run out of town. That night there was trouble. A young foreman gave Sally some lip when she tried to rush him off, and she shot him in the shoulder with a derringer she kept under her pillow. He wasn't hurt much, but he complained, and the sheriff took Sally to jail and kept her. Jake tried to bail her out, but the sheriff wouldn't take his money. Leave her sit, he said. Only Sally did more than sit. She bribed one of the deputies into bringing her some powders. She looked a mess, but somehow it was the mess about her that men couldn't resist. Jake couldn't himself. Somehow she could bring him to it despite her teeth and her oniony smells and the rest. She brought the deputy to it, too, and then tried to grab his gun and break jail, although if she had waited, the sheriff would have let her out in a day or two. Somehow, in fighting over the one gun, she and the deputy managed to shoot each other fatally. They died together on the cell floor in a pool of blood, both half-naked. The deputy had nine children, and his death caused an uproar against whores and gamblers, so much so that Jake thought it prudent to leave town. He searched Sally's room before he left and found six hundred dollars in a hat box. Since Sally was dead and buried, he took it. The whores who were left were so scared that they hired a buggy and came with him over to Dallas, where they soon found work in another saloon. In Dallas, Jake won some money from a soldier who reported that he had met a deputy sheriff from Arkansas. The deputy was looking for the sheriff, and the sheriff was looking for a man who had killed his brother. The soldier had forgotten all the names, and Jake didn't mention that he was the man being sought. The information made him nervous, though. The sheriff from Arkansas was evidently in Texas somewhere and might show up any time. While he was pondering what his next move might be, a hard-looking crew showed up in the saloon where he was playing. It consisted of three brothers, the Suggs brothers. Dan Suggs was the oldest and most talkative. The younger two, Ed and Roy, were sullen and restless, always watching the doors to see who might be coming in. Dan had no interest in doors or any apparent concern other than a need to have his whiskey glass filled rather often. All three were scraggly bearded men. Didn't you ranger? Dan asked when he heard Jake's name. I rangered some, Jake said. You run with Call and McCray, didn't you? Dan said. I've never met Call or McCray, but I've heard they're hard men. It irked Jake a little that those two had such reputations. It seemed to him that he had done about as much as they had in the rangering days. After all, he was the man who had shot one of the most famous bandits on the border. While they talked and played cards a little, Roy Suggs kept spitting tobacco on the barroom floor. It irked Ralph, the man who owned the bar. He brought over a spittoon and put it by Roy's chair, but Roy Suggs looked at him with a cold eye and continued to spit on the floor. Roy will spit where he pleases, Dan said with a mean grin. Spoon, how'd you like to be a regulator, he asked a little later. I recall from stories I've heard that you can shoot a gun. What is a regulator, Jake asked. I've not heard the term. Folks up in Kansas are getting tired of these Texas cattle tramping in constantly, Dan said. They want this trail driving business regulated. Regulated how? Well, taxed. Dan said. People can't go on driving cattle just anywhere. If they want to cross certain rivers at certain crossings, they've got to pay for the privilege. If they won't pay in cash, then they've got to pay in cattle. Is it the law in Kansas or what? Jake asked. It ain't, but some folks think it ought to be, Dan said. Us folks mainly, Roy said, spitting. I see, Jake said. If Carl and Gus try to take some cattle across one of them rivers you're regulating, then you stop them and tell them they have to pay. Is that how the scheme works? That's it, Dan said. I'd like to see you tell Woodrow Call he has to pay you money to drive cattle across a river, Jake said. 
I ain't a friend of the man. He's recently treated me poorly. But unless there's a law and you can show it to him, you won't be collecting no double eagles. Then he'll have to suffer the consequences, Dan said. Jake laughed. The consequences of that would be that somebody would have to dig your grave, he said. If Carl didn't shoot you, Gus would. They ain't used to taking orders from you regulators. By God, then they'll learn, Roy Suggs said. Maybe, but you won't teach them, Jake said. You'd be sitting dead in your saddle if you tried it. Though he was annoyed with Carl and Gus, it amused him that three scraggly bandits thought they could beat them. Dan Suggs was not pleased with the conversation either. I thought you might be a man with some gumption, he said. I see I was wrong. I can supply enough gumption, Jake said, but I don't ride with inexperienced men. If you think you can ride up to Call and McRae and collect money from them with a few threats, then you're too inexperienced for me. Dan was silent for a bit. Well, they're just one bunch, he said. There are plenty of other herds on the trail. That's right, Jake said. If I was you, I'd try to regulate some of the ones that ain't been led by Texas Rangers. Roy and Ed looked at him hostily. They didn't like hearing it suggested that they weren't up to the job. But Dan Suggs was a cooler man. After they'd played some cards and worked through a bottle of whiskey, he admitted that the regulating scheme was something he'd just thought up. My notion was that most cowboys can't fight, Dan said. Hell, they're just boys. Them settlers up there can't fight neither. A lot of them might pay us to keep the beeves out of their corn patches. They might, but it sounds like you're speculating, Jake said. Before I leave this here easy life to go and get shot at, I'd like a little better prospect to think about. How about Robin Banks if the regulating don't work out? Dan asked bluntly. You got any objections to Robin Banks? It would depend on the bank, Jake said. I wouldn't enjoy it if there was too much law stacked up against me. I'd think you'd want to pick small towns. They talked for several hours, Roy Suggs resolutely spitting tobacco on the floor. Dan Suggs pointed out that all the money seemed to be in Kansas. If they went up there and weren't too particular about what they did, they ought to be able to latch onto some of it. Jake found the Suggs brothers unattractive. They all had cold, mean eyes and no great affection even for one another. Roy and Ed almost got into a gunfight over a hand of cards. He offered to get them whores, for he had stayed friendly with several of the girls who had come over from Fort Worth, but the Suggs brothers weren't interested. Drinking and card playing appealed to them more. Had it not been for the threat of July Johnson somewhere around, he would have let the Suggs brothers head for Kansas without him. He was comfortable where he was, and had no appetite for hard riding and gunfighting. But Dallas wasn't far from Fort Smith, and July Johnson might arrive any time. That was an uncomfortable thought, so uncomfortable that three days later Jake found himself riding north with the three Suggs boys and a tall black man they called Frog Lip. Jake equipped himself with a new rifle before they left. He had made the Suggs brothers no promises, and as soon as he found a nice saloon in Kansas, he meant to let them go their way. Frog Lip owned five guns of various calibers and spent most of his time cleaning them. He was a fine marksman. The first day out he brought down a deer at a distance Jake would have considered impossible. Frog Lip seemed to take the shot for granted. Jake had the strong feeling that the black man's guns would soon be pointed at something besides deer, but he himself didn't plan to be around to see it. Chapter 65 July rode for days without seeing any person, or for that matter, many signs of life except the hawks and buzzards circling in the blue prairie sky. Once he saw a wolf loping along a ridge, and at night he heard coyotes, but the only game he saw were jackrabbits, and it was mostly rabbit he ate. He kept going north, reminding himself that it was a long way to any towns, but soon the unvarying emptiness of the country began to disturb him, and he was already disturbed enough by the deaths of three people buried on the Canadian. He thought of them more or less all day, 